You can support this podcast on patreon.com forward slash first paw media. Here's to the adventure seeking dog mushers out there. The hundreds of you who stand on the runners dreaming and thinking about the northern lights. Of course, there is something else you can do if you've got something to say. Start a podcast with First Paw Media and harness your creative side. Maybe even earn enough money. Enough money to tell yourself, hey, I'm not just a dog musher. I'm a rover. I'm a wanderer. I'm a voyager. I'm an explorer. Visit firstpaw.media. Mush on over today. Radio Free Palmer 89.5 KVRF presents Mushing Radio, hosted by Robert Forto. Mushing Radio is about dog-powered sports, living in the Great White North, and mushing. Visit our website at mushingradio.com. Here is your host, Robert Forto. Hey, Mushing Radio listeners. We mentioned this earlier in our Iditarod coverage, but we set up a way to take questions from our listeners. Please leave a voicemail at 303-578-9881 or send a voice memo at firstpawmedia at gmail.com. Leave your name and where you are calling from. And please, if you want us to use it, Keep your questions to under 30 seconds. That's it. Let me give you the number again. 303-578-9881. Or you can send a voice memo to firstpawmedia at gmail.com. We can't wait to hear from you. Hello and welcome everybody. This is Robert and you're listening to our continued coverage of the Iditarod here on Mushing Radio. I am here tonight with both of my co-hosts, Tony and Michelle, and after a day's hiatus for both Tony and I, I'm sure <laughs> Michelle is happy to have us back. Tony, what's happening? Um, well, it's been a pretty quiet day here at home. It was my day off, but I did get up uh, very early to speak to some middle schoolers about I did a rod. They are on uh, the... I think they're on East Coast time. I don't know. It was several. They were coming back from lunch, and I was just waking up when I got to do the little presentation Q and A, whatever. And uh, it was a lot of fun. I I even quoted Waddy McDonald uh, uh, saying that he was freezing his giblets off that year that he wore the kilt when he finished in Nome. So I I think I was a big hit with that quote, as it was middle schoolers, but been pretty good today. (laughs) I love talking to the school kids. Michelle and I do a couple of those a year, and it's definitely the highlight of our year for sure. Michelle, how are things up here in Willow? They are well. Um, I was deep involved in one of my final papers for one of my final classes in my master's program. And regarding the school students, this year we uh, did a presentation for our youngest group ever. They were four-year-olds, and it was quite interesting and a lot of fun. Um, Our 12-year-old Siberian Husky, Bodie, has been doing this his entire life, and this year he was absolutely perfect for this group of about 24-year-olds. And for folks that may not know, a heck of a lot of teachers around uh, the United States, possibly uh, around the world, I'm not sure, do the Iditarod section of of their curriculum every March. And they include not only the race, but they include ways to include math and science and reading and all that. It's definitely a cool program. And that is one of the main reasons why they have the teacher on the trail And hopefully we can talk about that program a little bit in a different episode. So let's pull up what's happening on the trail right now. Uh, So let me do a quick refresh. And it looks like Brent Sass is in first place with 11 dogs. And I'm saying the dogs because it's going to come into importance here in just a second. Jesse Holmes with 11. Nick with 10. Kelly with 10. Ryan with 12. Richie Deal with 12, and we have a very Richie cool... Richie Deal with 11. With nope. 11. Uh, Millie with 9, Pete Kaiser with 11, Matt Failer 11, Christian Turner with 12, and then I'm going to scroll down a little bit, 
and mention Ramey Smith. And it looks like he has only nine dogs as well. So we're going to talk about that in just a second. Eight. 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 He has eight dogs. So mine is not refreshing <laughs> like yours guys is. And then in the back of the pack, we have Greg Vitello, Gerhardt, Jed, Eric, Bailey, and Jason pulling up the rear. So a little bit of I did a math. And we were talking a little bit about this before airtime. Greg Vitello is currently in last place, our Red Lantern winner, and he is currently at mile 394. The next closest person is Gerhardt at mile 432. But more importantly is Brent Sass currently at 568. That is a big deal because there is a rule in the rule book that says you must remain competitive. And often it's not the musher who is uh, one to sort of raise the white flag and say, yep, I'm too far behind. It is the race crew that says that. What can you tell me, tell us about that rule, Tony? Uh, it's pretty self-explanatory. It's up to the race judges and the race marshal. Of course, Mark Nordeman makes the final call. Um, typically what happens is a musher that has fallen a little bit too far behind, um, they get a warning to, you know, try and hurry it up, uh, try to keep up with the back of the pack. Um, and then they are, they're given enough time to see if, you know, they'll change a little bit of strategy. Now they may not be able to just because of the way that they train their dogs or whatnot. And we do know that, you know, Greg's had some issues earlier on in the race with the Happy River Steps, the Gorge, some Buffalo and the Buffalo Tunnels and, and all of that. But most mushers deal with that. So um, it, it's hard to know, especially with such a small roster, what the plan is. But the further behind a um, team is from the rest of the pack, the longer a checkpoint has to stay open. And the logistics of Iditarod is the checkpoint stays open until the last musher's out. And then that checkpoint closes down as fast as possible, gets on an airplane, the volunteers do, and they fly off further down the trail to then help check in teams coming in or even put up the next checkpoint that they're at. So the whole idea of... Um, you know, just letting, you know, just, just be okay with it and let it, the logistics just don't work with that. And so it's, it's kind of hard to tell. It's been something that fans and, and mushers that are staying home this year have all kind of been watching and wondering, you know, they thought maybe McGrath would be where they pulled him. Um, it'll be interesting to see if they let him go all the way to Unilaquit or if they let him go all the way to Nome. I'm pulling for him. I think with a, a smaller roster, it may be, especially since everybody's still so compact and racing together, it may be to his advantage. But at the same time, if Sass or Holmes or Kaiser or any of them decide to pull away, that's going to just make it that much harder for the race marshal to justify keeping a checkpoint open for one team. You know, Tony, I agree with you to a certain point here that the the fact that the field is smaller may be actually playing into his favor. Um, Robert, how far is it from Ofer, which is the checkpoint that we see on our chart here that he is pulled out of? How far is it from Ofer to Iditarod, where a large number of the back of the Packers are are in and out of rather quickly, if you will, but that large group is not into sh Shagaluk yet. So I'm interested to know the distance between Ofer, Iditarod, and Shagaluk. So it is 80 miles from Ofer to Iditarod and then about another 60-ish miles or so from Iditarod to Shagaluk. So uh, quite a bit of distance between those two checkpoints. And when you're traveling the speed that the back of the Packers are going, that's definitely a uh, at least one camping stop uh, in between those two checkpoints. Now, whether they take, you know, if they go uh, over camp, I did a rod, camp, shagaluk, that's really up to training. And that's what uh, Tony was talking about, just how 
uh, robust your training program is and, you know, the, the amount of long runs that you can do. But, you know, these days, teams aren't training as long as they used to. I know that the CVs uh, do very short runs compared to what used to happen back in the day when Robert Sorley and Lance Mackey were doing those 100-mile training runs. A lot of people don't do that anymore. Is that right, Tony? It really depends. Um, you know, it's just it, like Mitch said in a post not too long ago about timing and strategy, you know, I did a rod, you have to kind of camp in the checkpoints just the way that they're spread out um, to really be competitive. We see that deviate a little bit when you're talking about a Brent Sass, but for the most part, the rest happens in the checkpoints. So you don't see a lot of camping trips like you used to when the race was slower. Um, and I think that's where we are getting to that point where people are talking about having a pro class and an adventure class similar to what Iron Dog does so that those that are hyper competitive who can train all year round for this one big race, they can have their race. But then those that are just wanting to live the Iditarod dream, which is very important to this race, in my opinion, when we're still trying to play up that whole idea of we want to continue the tradition of the dogs in the native communities you got to make it so that they can have that dream and not just have these guys that have the big sponsorships on the, the road system. So, um, that's a huge yeah. point. Tony. <laughs> that's a huge point, Tony, because this in particular, um, field in my opinion is, is much more leaning towards that adventure style musher even though a lot of them have been doing this for a long time and they are competitive or semi-competitive, we can take a look right here at Jason Mackey. We all know he's competitive, but he's training a puppy team this year. And so that would uh, allow him as an adventurer uh, participating in the Iditarod to ha have a little bit more validity to focus more on training those puppies, Robert. Don't mm -hmm. you agree? Yeah, I agree. And and it really just breaks down to strategy and where these guys are running, especially if they're running other people's dogs. They have very strict schedules to follow. I know that uh, Christian Turner has a much different uh, strategy than Gerhardt Thehart has, just because of one running the quote-unquote A team and the other person running the B team. So there is a definite strategy shift there. But more importantly, I think uh, a topic that we need to talk about is the mileage between uh, Greg and Gerhardt, which is currently about 48 miles. So that's a pretty good distance. And if you're traveling at about eight miles an hour, that's at least six or seven, maybe eight hours, depending on conditions and everything, the distance between the two. So that will come into play as we work our way down the trail. So it's something to watch out for. And this is definitely something that the fans talk a lot about. So we'll be seeing decisions being made uh, probably one way or the other in the next couple of days. I mentioned in our standings report that uh, the number of dogs, and I talked about the the folks that had 11 or 12 dogs. Remember, you start with 14 and then you have to finish with five in harness. And what that means mm -hmm. is you cannot have one or two dogs in in the sled bag as you're pulling into Nome. All five dogs have to be running in harness. And that's a very important distinction. So uh, a couple of teams already have only nine dogs. And that's, is it Millie or Mill? Uh, Tony? Milla. 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 It's Milla. Milla has nine. Nick has 10, but Ramey has eight. So Ramey is currently running to Shagaluk from Iditarod. So he's not quite to the halfway point yet, and he only has eight dogs. So technically, he can only drop three more. And I know that there's a big strategy about dropping dogs as you get closer to the coast. I know Dallas used to call it unleashing the monster where he would drop all of his quote unquote slower dogs and, and put his speed demons in in the harness for the last section of the race. So there's definitely strategy there. Uh, Jason Mackey, it looks like only has nine dogs as well. So I think that that's a big deal, at least from a musher's perspective, when you're only down, when you're down to only 
eight or nine dogs this early into the race. What is your opinion or what have you heard, if anything, Tony? Um, I haven't heard too much about Ramey's race at all, which is pretty typical. He doesn't have, you know, a, a big social media presence or anything like that. Um, it is a little concerning to me that he's down to eight. And I've been wondering ever since I saw him go down to nine, um, whether or not it's just that he wasn't truly prepared for this year's Iditarod, as we mentioned several times uh, over the last week, he entered very, very late. And we wondered if, you know, there was even time for him to truly be ready for this race. Um, he dropped out of several races that he entered again, very late in the season. He entered them just to drop out of them. So it's kind of, you know, you kind of wonder what's going on there. It, was the team just not ready and he wanted to just focus on Iditarod and then they're still not completely ready. Is this a rebuilding year? Lots of questions going into that. Ramey's a very hardened veteran of this trail, um, and he does right by his dog. So it, I I would assume that, if anything, he'll baby them along if he needs to. Um, but, you know, as soon as he gets past the Yukon, then he's golden. So I, I think as long as he can keep that eight going through the Yukon, we should be good to go. With Jason, the only thing I've seen is um, he is running a very young team, as Michelle said, and they haven't seen this kind of mileage in a race yet. So I would assume that that's a lot to do with it. Plus, we've seen a lot of dogs have to return very early on because of trail conditions with the snow turning to mush or mashed potatoes, as they were calling it, uh, very early in the race. So um, just a lot of minor injuries. And there is a stomach bug going around. Um, several teams have uh, mentioned that. I believe it was Hunter Keith who said it was either Hunter Keith or Eddie Burke, one of the two top for rookie of the year, said that um, they had to return a dog just because that was the only dog right now showing signs of having a stomach bug. And they were trying to make sure that the other dogs didn't catch it if, as best as they could. So a heck of a lot of things going on, and that's only our first section or first segment of this show, but we have some stories for you. Uh, the first story, or one of the biggest stories in, in uh, the last 24 hours, is Nick Petit pulling into, um, uh, where was that? Uh, Shagaluk. Antic. Where Shagaluk uh, was the, the checkpoint, Tony? Uh, what are we talking about, Nick? Yeah, Nick, for the for the uh, first of the Yukon, is that uh, Anvik or Shackle? That would be Jesse Holmes. That's oh, Jesse I'm sorry. Holmes and it's Je Jesse Holmes. <laughs> Jesse Holmes and it's Anvik. So, yes, uh, everything runs together. So, Jesse Holmes pulled in, uh, I guess it was pretty early this morning, and uh, he was the, the recipient of the first to the Yukon award. Now, that award is a fan favorite because it's that huge multi-course meal that they get prepared for him over a camp stove by a chef that flies out to do this particularly for this event. And it's interesting because a lot of times, especially if it's a very compact field, like it sort of is now, a lot of times these guys will not stop in time to make this meal because they get the meal all over again sometime in the off season and they get it for a guest too. Now for years, this was hosted by uh, one of the big sponsors of the race, the Millennium slash the Lakefront, which is the hotel downtown that uh, is the quote unquote headquarters of the race, but they're no longer a sponsor. So this year, the Marx Brother Cafe, which is a pretty fancy little restaurant downtown Anchorage, they're the ones that are doing it. But what's interesting that we found, it does not look like they're doing the money portion. And the money portion has a lot of history in this race. I remember one year they said that they were not going to do the money portion. And the Mush and Mortician, Scott Jansen, decided at the last minute to pony up the uh, $3,000 in $1 bills. And since he is a mortician, I guess he built or bought or some little coffin type thing and put all of the money in there. So that's a pretty cool story. But uh, they are, it looks like 
they're not doing the money portion this year. But Michelle, you want to mention a little bit about the Marx Brothers Cafe. We have not had a chance to eat there yet. I'm thinking we need to do, to do a date night. Uh, you know, our anniversary is uh, on... Tomorrow. Yes, we're on the eve of that. Um, so this restaurant, I wanted to br- highlight it a little bit for our fans that... You know, if you guys ever get up here to Alaska, it is worth your time to do a reservation for the Marx Brothers Cafe. It is by far one of the most recommended restaurants in the Pacific Northwest, and it has been around since 1991. The reason why it is not so highly read about or known about is because it is such a private romantic affair to attend. They only have 14 tables in their house and that's what they refer to their restaurant as. They serve on average about 60 guests a night and reservations are highly recommended. I can imagine that this place most likely has reservations out for quite a while. So get in, get your reservations set up, and then book your flight. Have you ever been to the Marx Brothers Cafe, Tony? No, I hadn't even heard about it until I did a run. So I think this is really good for them. It's really good for the race. Um, just seeing the, the few clips of the, the food that I did a Insider had this morning uh i'm still starving look at some looking at some of the things that jesse got to partake in so, well i'm gonna make it worse uh, for yeah. you i'm gonna make it worse for Uh-oh. you they offer culinary <laughs> they offer culinary classes whoa so this is something that is very unique so so it's called vans classes and so during these classes they're available for 15 or more people they start at 12 p.m promptly Um, You can do stuff like learn how to make a proper Caesar salad, right? There's four variations of Caesar salad that you can learn to make. Um, The cost per class here varies. The Caesar salad class is $105 per person. Wow. There's a food and wine. uh, Explore wine pairing with 18 foods and nine wines. $135 $135 per guest. Wine and cheeses of the world, $135. Buzzle, bubbles, taste five champagnes and four sparking and 18 foods. Wow. $175 a guest. So, you know, this place seems really ritzy and uh, like a lot of fun. And I'm really glad that they stepped out there and are participating in the Iditarod. And I guess that uh, that Jesse really liked the cheesecake from the stories I read. So th- th- this sounds like a cool sponsor, and I'm glad that we're able to showcase one a little bit because so many people that listen to this show are uh, folks that, that make their way to Alaska, whether it's for the Iditarod or in the summer on a cruise ship or whatever. So definitely put it down on your list to check out the Marx Brother Cafe. So next up on our list is a very cool story about Richie Deal. What can you tell us about that, Tony? Um, so Richie is one of our uh, chase pack, I guess, since Sass and Holmes are out just a little bit ahead of both Richie Deal and Pete Kaiser. And he had chosen to go into grailing for his eight-hour uh, mandatory rest. So his wife flew with their um, somewhat brand new baby. He's he's just a few months old. Uh, flew out to Grayling to surprise Richie when he came in. And if you go to his Facebook page, Real Deal Racing, Deal spelled like his last name, um, they have pictures of a very exhausted Richie Deal sitting on the floor and he's got baby in his lap and it looks like dad's going to fall asleep before baby does, but it's just a a really sweet little story. Um, And it's something that we don't often see. Uh, It's another, I guess, blessing of having the GPS tracker. You can kind of gauge when your muster is going to be in there. Um, But for the most part, you kind of know what their schedule looks like. So either way, this could have been planned, but 
Um, it's just such a great way to boost the spirits of your of your musher. You know, we, we can send musher grams out. You know, they can take a cell phone out now and hear from their loved one. But it's another thing to actually get to see and hug a physical person that's on your team with no, you know, uh, asking for autographs or asking them to be anybody who they're not already and. Um, so I'm sure it definitely boosts his spirits. Richie's doing a phenomenal job. He and he and Pete are right there in the mix, uh, giving giving them all heck. And I'm I'm really excited for the Cusco boys. I said that uh, in a tweet earlier that I just love seeing them challenge it, especially since you know everyone's talking about SAS, Holmes, and Petit. For sure. And another story that that you mentioned because you are a subscriber, but it's my understanding that the I. The insider has been down most of the day. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, their live feeds have been sketchy the last couple of days. It's been a while since the race has actually been on this trail. So trying to figure out what infrastructure they needed, I think, has been a difficulty for them. Um, there's also just not really great internet out there. <laughs> so it, it was bound to happen. But it's been down for... I'd say most of the day um, they were having audio issues this morning and then just it's gone completely. And so they've had to replay their documentaries from past years, which are always fun to watch. But, you know, it was kind of like, go back to, you know, Iditarod or somewhere. If you've got, if you've still got a feed, we, we really wanted that back of the pack and we've been, We've been promised more of that, and also we were kind of spoiled with the the gold loop trail because with them looping back, that meant we got to have the back of the pack because the front pack was coming through again. So um, it it's always it's always an experience with Insider. Um, I think this is the biggest blackout that I've seen them have in quite a while. So. I'm sure Heister and team are very frustrated as they're trying to fix whatever the problem is. And they they have so much time on their hands that Greg Heister happens to have enough of it to answer <laughs> your I did a question. And we're going to talk about that in just a second. So yeah. with this insider, you said that they replay the documentaries uh, that they do each race. And I know that you're an avid collector of these DVDs. <laughs> I, have, I have to ask, do you have a favorite year? And if so, why? Uh, that's like choosing a child because I don't have a child. So all I have are these sad little collections of DVDs. <laughs> um <laughs> Um, I think I, I don't know if it's actually an insider video. I think it's like a year or two older than the actual insider. But one of my favorite ones is the 2005 DVD. I think it was the first one that went on DVD. Um, <laughs> uh, and that one is just because it was Dallas Seavey's rookie race, which means he's running his dad's puppy team. His older brother Tyrell was also running that year. And then you had Mitch running, of course. And so Tyrell got to have like this B team, if you would. And so Dallas, his schedule was keeping him way far back in the pack. And they interviewed, Danny Seavey was in Takatna, I guess, keeping eyes out on baby brother or whatever. And um, they interviewed Danny and he just basically roasted Dallas for this entire little mini interview. And it's probably one of my favorite moments on all of it, just because I have that connection with the family. Uh, they're all really good. Um, if you're a Lance Mackey fan, definitely the 2008 DVD is fantastic because that's the one that he snuck out of the checkpoint uh, around a sleeping Jeff King. Um, but Discovery Channel actually followed that race that year, and their DVD is better because they have a longer version of how that happened, and it's more entertaining. So. Uh, now, are are these the videos that they show at the Iditarod headquarters, is or is that something else? Yep, it yep. is. Yep, it's the same one that they sell. It's yeah, Greg puts it all together with all the footage that they collect. Well, not all, but a lot of the footage that they collect uh, throughout the race that we see live or that's uploaded live or semi live, and um, he cobbles it all together to tell the story that he wants to tell. So it's mainly the front runners. 
um, with just a few little rookie interviews here and there. Uh, but there, I, I think they're a really good retelling of of the story. Um, they they're definitely right up there with the old documentaries that we used to get from PBS back when Susan Butcher was running in the '80s. I have a couple of those. They're on VHS though. For for the kids, that means they're on this big black tape thing that went into a box that played, and you had to rewind it and all of that kind of stuff. Do you do you still have a VHS player? I have two. Whoa. We, we don't even have... I'm, <laughs> we just had to go out and buy a DVD player for our college class just the other day because we don't even have one of those. Everything that we have now... And we have tons and tons of, of, of DVDs and Blu-rays, but uh, we didn't even have a working player. So very interesting. So if you're ever at the Iditarod headquarters and you kind of wander back to the back where all the trophies are, and there's all those chairs that you can sit down and watch these videos. That's exactly what Tony is, is talking about. And I assume that they just sort of pick them randomly to, to pop in the DVD player on any particular day because they just run all day long, and you can just kind of just stop in and watch them as they're going. So that is the stories of the day. I know we're running a little bit long, and we, we have a couple of segments to go. So let's jump right into our mushers of the day. And I say mushers because we're talking about the father and son pair, Greg and Bailey Vitello. And there's a little bit of a connection here way back when, I would say maybe seven, eight, maybe even nine years ago, I interviewed Bailey on Dogworks Radio. And that's when he was just starting out from going from a sprint musher into more competitive distance slash expedition type stuff for his company, Northern Exposure Outfitters uh, Dog Sledding Equipment, which is sort of his company that's based in New Hampshire. So, Michelle, who are you starting with? And tell us a little bit about their bios. Well, I'm going to start with Greg. Greg began mushing around 25 years ago and was drawn to the idea of spending time with his dogs in the wilderness along with his wife and family. He is very honored to be running with Bailey, who took to, the, to mushing and has assisted in building their racing dog team together. Um, they... They really do uh, look to this experience as being one of the pivotal moments of both of their lives, as he says. The uh, current team that he has, you guys may find this interesting as far as stats go, especially those of you running fantasy teams. Greg has uh, Alaskan Huskies ranging in age from three to seven, and about 50% of his team has some range of experience on the Iditarod Trail, meaning there's 50% of his team that has no experience on the Iditarod Trail. So that may be affecting his run. Now with Bailey, as Robert mentioned, he is the owner of Northern Exposure Outfitters Dog Sledding Equipment up in New Hampshire, which is where the family hails from. He has been running dogs since he was three years old, and he was inspired one day to take on the Iditarod Trail, which is his ultimate test of much mushing abilities and a true testament to the connection that I have with my dog team, he says. He has uh, traveled throughout the United States, Canada, and France, competing in some of the world's most famous and challenging races and he looks forward to taking on the Iditarod, as I already mentioned. His current team is ranging in age from three to eight years old and has quite a few with experience on the Iditarod Trail. So it sounds like Bailey got the better of the dogs for this run. Um, but Robert knows all too well about strategies, as do most of these mushing families Typically, the younger generation gets the B team, like Tony was mentioning. But in this particular situation, I believe Bailey got the A team. 
Yeah, and, and that can kind of be sorted out in the standings. And we, we spent quite a bit of time on Greg being that uh, Red Lantern holder as we speak. But Bailey is a few spots ahead of him. Uh, Greg is at 32 and Bailey is at 28. Uh, and, and just those couple of spots have separated them. And, but it, more importantly, the miles have separated them. So very interesting uh, story between the two. What do you know about uh, the father-son duo, Tony? Sure. So I um, chatted with both of their significant others uh, earlier today, and I'm going to go ahead and follow Michelle's lead and talk about Greg first and then talk about Bailey. I do want to uh, also read what Eileen, Greg's wife, uh, wrote to me this morning. She says, good morning, Tony. We are big fans of Mushing Radio and truly grateful for all that you do, promoting, supporting, and preserving the sport of dog mushing. Bravo. So thank you, Eileen, for your words of encouragement and support. We appreciate it. Um, so she said, what makes Greg tick? Goals, passion, and perseverance. The love of the dogs and the passion they have to be on the trail is the driving force by, <clears throat> excuse me, behind running dogs and having our son Bailey as passionate as he is also dedicated to preserving the sled dog, not only in Alaska, but in the lower 48, and especially back east in New England, having the ability to inspire the future generations of mushers to come is truly a blessing. And then I also asked, what's one thing that Greg has to take out on the trail? She said, the first thing that comes to mind, and he always has on his person and backups and sled and every drop bag, is Bert's beeswax chapstick would have to be his can't live without number one have to have, closely followed by the booty horn in which he keeps on his person or in his arm's reach at all times. Uh, she also gave us uh, snacks since she saw the, the question to everybody. Uh, food is beef jerky, peanut M&Ms, and his delicious, nutritious frozen trail meals prepared and packed by Mike Ellis. Um, so I, I appreciated her giving me even more information. It just kind of gives us a little more insight into what a musher brings that you don't necessarily think of. And I don't know what a booty horn is. Is that like a sock horn or a shoe horn? I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not familiar. You're the musher. You're supposed to know these things. <laughs> oh, okay, I'm going to throw it out there. I'm going to throw it out there to our ugly dogs. Somebody in the ugly dogs has got to be able to find out what a booty horn is. Yes. So what do you know about... And it is booty with an IE, so it's not like we're talking booty like your bottom. Yeah, it, it, it looks like it looks like a shoe Robert, horn. Robert Googled it. Yeah, it looks like but a shoe we, horn. We need confirmation. <laughs> yep. Okay, what do you know what do you know about Bailey? All right. So, um for what makes Bailey tick. Bailey is a competitive person in nature, but has always had a great respect for his team's capabilities and his own as well. Bailey knows his dogs and works hard to make sure that they receive the best care on and off the trail. Seeing the results of his care for the team throughout the trail when not a single dog was sore after their 24 hour rest in McGrath is something he is very proud of and takes great pride in. He understands that there is still so much to learn even while being on the trail and that taking it all in and enjoying the adventure is what this race is all about. Some of the things that Bailey has to have in his sled other than mandatory gear, blue Jolly Ranchers are a must. Coffee, whether it's decaf or not, he uses the steeping bags from Black Rifle Coffee a lot. This one I found interesting. She says, he takes a tennis ball to help work out knots in his legs and to play with the dogs. It's got a dual purpose. Phone with audiobooks to keep his mind active, Snickers bars, sunglasses, they're his pit vipers. The snow glare on the trail is unreal, so they are a necessity. Boost chocolate nutritional drink, warm Gatorade. Ugh. She says it actually hits the spot on the trail his homemade insulated heater pouch for his meal to stay warm while feeding dogs, knee pads which keep him from getting sore at checkpoints while caring for dogs and keeps his pants dry, bath and boots for at longer checkpoints to get out of the shoes you're wearing all the time, and Bailey, oh, oh, and then she told me that Bailey's favorite pizza is barbecue chicken bacon ranch. 
And that's going to come into play in just a day or so on our coverage. So yep. stay tuned about the pizza toppings for sure. Now, to clarify, was that Bailey's mom or was that somebody else that answered for him? Um, his fiance, Brianna, is the one who answered for Bailey. Okay, very good. So mom got her insight on uh, on Greg or dad and then, of course, uh, his significant other for him. I really like the in-depthness of that, especially uh, what they pack mm -hmm. on the sled. And remember I said a couple of days ago, I keep notes. I think it's a good idea to have those knee pads. I think that would really come into handy when you're taking care of the right? dog's feet and all that. I think I will definitely need to carry those. So thanks for uh, sharing. Go uh, ahead, Michelle. I, I think that uh, Santa might be putting a booty horn in your stuff. Yeah, I might need a booty horn as well. Uh <laughs> I, I I definitely uh, struggle sometimes to get shoes on and off, but I do also like that tennis ball. That I, was for the dogs, I believe, the booty horn. I suffer from plantar fasciitis, and, and those tennis balls can work wonders for that. Mm -hmm. So uh, these guys are both rookies, as we said, and I know that we talked earlier in the show about Greg sort of falling behind, but they have... They have my support. I'm pulling for these guys. I said that on our kickoff show. I really hope that these guys do well. And it would be just a cool story to have uh, dad and son finish. I think that would be pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. It's been a while since we had that. Of course, we talk about the Barringtons all the time. And, you know, we occasionally have the husband and wife. But I think it's been a while, hasn't it, since we've had a father-son or father-daughter duo out there in a while? Um, just last year with oh. Mitch and Dallas. Oh, yeah, but they're, they're old. He's not counting yeah. them. They're old news. I mean, you, you know, they, they do it every year. He considers them one body. Uh, which, which, which also is a very interesting story. I saw, I guess it was yesterday that Mitch Seavey uh, celebrated... Let's not forget the Barrington twins. Yes, I talked about that. Yes. Uh, Mitch celebrated his anniversary with his wife, and he said it's... I think he mm -hmm. said it was the second time in 18 years or something like that because he's always yep. out on the Iditarod Trail uh, during this time. Uh, so congratulations to them as well. We could definitely talk about these little stories uh, all night long. But let's jump into our last segment of the night. And that is our I did a question of the day. Yesterday, Michelle was flying solo and asked oh, this question. I'm going to cut you off and remind you that I have my science tips. Save that for tomorrow. Oh, save it. Oh. Save that oh, one. Save that it's one a good one, though, because right now we're dealing with that. Yes. Yeah, save it for tomorrow so we can stay on our segment task for sure. <laughs> um, so yesterday, Michelle was flying solo and asked the question, uh, what is what would be your favorite or must have trail snack if you were doing Iditarod? And and uh, Tony posted that on social media after the show and got a lot of responses. I was up late and up early, and I was reading all these uh, throughout the night. And I would have to say, overwhelmingly, it was cookies, wasn't it, Tony? Uh, yeah, cookies and M&Ms of all different flavors <laughs> um, seemed to be something that we got. But yeah, cookies were definitely, I think, the top one. Um, Several people even said that my I did a cookies were the ones that they would take out there. But that's cruel to me because that takes a lot of work on my part. Those are hard to decorate, guys. So uh, get your orders in now if you really want them out on the trail. Um, and like you said, Greg Heister chimed in last night. Um, he said salmon strips were what he would take out on the trail. And I guess that's what he actually takes since he's out there. Um we have pie. We have, of course, the, the little frozen cheesecakes that you can get at Costco, which is what Jesse Holmes referenced this morning when uh, he said that he's been eating the wrong cheesecake. He's really into the Marx Brothers cheesecake now, which it did look good. I'm not a cheesecake person, but it did look very, very nice there on the plate. Uh, truffles were another one. A lot of people had truffles and those protein balls, the peanut butter, oatmeal, grossness, um, and cliff bars. All stuff that, that, uh, that does well in those cold temperatures. I think that they're right on point. So they've been paying attention to 
uh, things that would be handy out on the Iditarod Trail. So speaking okay. of your cookies, I saw, I have seen your cookies <laughs> over the last few years, and they're on point in terms of decoration. You do a great job. I think, Thank you. I think we need to put it out there and offer a, a batch of your cookies for an ultra-exclusive Patreon level. I don't know what we could do, <laughs> but uh, maybe at the $25 level or something like that, because they there do take... Go take so much time and then you can make up a batch and throw them in a cookie tin and, and ship them off to, uh, to one of our Patreon followers. And we'll tell you how to do that at the end of the show, if that's what you're interested in. So our question for tonight is not related to food or what you would take on the trail, which has sort of been the theme this far. It is litter name themes. And Tony came up with this one this afternoon because I was running out of questions. And I, I really like this one because like a lot of other mushers, we have to name all of our litters in themes. And we haven't had a whole lot of litters here, but let's talk a little bit about a couple of ours. I'll have Michelle go right after me and we'll just talk about a few of them. Our most recent couple of litters is the Rock and Roller Crew. We call them all crews. We have the Rock and Roller Crew and the reggae crew. Our rock and roller crew obviously are related to rock music. We have Grohl, Sully, Hendrix, Jazz, Cobain, Cobain, Jagger, and who am I missing? Jazz. Jazz. So those are our rock and roller crew. And then they're, uh, I guess they would be cousins, right? Uh, they are the reggae crew. And we have Ziggy and Marley. What's a couple other crews that we have, Michelle? Oh, my goodness. Uh, one of the students' favorite crews is when we tell them all about the WAG crew. And the WAG crew stands for Wallace and Gromit, which was a uh, claymation <laughs> uh, British cartoon, if you will. And the character uh, Wallace and his dog Gromit love eating cheese. And so in that crew, there were just four of them, and they were two sets of twins. So we have Wallace and Gromit and Swiss and Skeelig, which Skeelig is an Irish cheese. And I couldn't resist because they are uh, reddish blonde colored dogs. Um, the second favorite is one of the first crews, uh, the first two crews that we had. The Nightmare Before Christmas crew, we named them Lock, Shock, Barrel, and Burton. And then we have the 9-11 um, crew, which we honored um, the rescue dogs that participated in 9-11, the rescue and therapy dogs that participated. And we named six of them after those dogs. And they were born on 9-11, what, uh, 10 Two years? 2011. So 10 years later. So we have Apollo... Uh, Brie, Sirius, I'm forgetting. I know you are. It's okay. I was waiting for you to struggle. We have Brie, <laughs> we have Brie, Brie, Apollo, Hanson, Salty, Tikva, and um, yeah, those are the dogs. There you go. So oh, Sirius, like you said. So yeah, that uh, that is our cruise, and there's a reason behind all this madness, because one of the most prevalent questions when we have visitors come over, they'll say, how in the world do you know all the dogs' names? Or do you know all these dogs' names if you have 30? They all look exactly the same. They're all black or brown or white or you, whatever. You must admit that you do struggle. I do struggle sometimes <laughs> when you have that many. So Tony... You're not a musher, but obviously you've been around sled dogs, especially the, the CV kennels. Just about every musher I'm aware of has this theme that they do. Uh, and, and you'd be surprised just how in-depth mushers can go where they'll say, oh, you know, so-and-so is, is the offspring of so-and-so, which goes back 16 generations to so-and-so. And, you know, they come from Susan mm -hmm. Butcher Lines and Joe Garney and Carl Huntington and all of these guys. They go way back and they know all the lines. But why did you pick this question in particular for tonight? Um, well, we're going to go back to the whole food theme that we've had on these questions. And it basically came from uh, Dewclaw Kennel 
has a very popular dog. His name is Egg Roll. He's a giant dog. He is, uh, Dan Caduce said in an interview yesterday that he believes and he's been told that Egg Roll, his dog Egg Roll, is the largest dog in the Iditarod this year. Um, so uh, when he was running one of the races earlier this year and I had shared on social media the lineup of his team in that race, uh, everyone jumped on the fact that he has a dog named Egg Roll and he has a dog named Dumpling. And so one of my favorite litter themes of all time is definitely Dewclaw's Asian food litter. Uh, it's just such an awesome name, especially for this large dog to be named Egg Roll. But I will also mention that Mitch Seavey does not use litter themes anymore. I think he did way back in the day because he did have a Chicago Bears litter theme uh, that were his superstars in the 2008 All-Alaska Sweepstakes that he won. Uh, Ditka is one of my absolute favorite dogs out of that kennel. And um, one of the Mitch CV quote unquote rejects that Dallas took on was named Fridge. And that dog was just, he was just a hoot. So, um, but for the most part, Mitch doesn't use themes. So uh, I think he's kind of the odd man out in that way. <laughs> right. And, and, and there's a reason behind all this madness. When you have a bunch of dogs, you have to be very creative with how you name names because you can only uh think so hard about uh you know coming up with with these different these different types and i've told you guys time and time again that i am not superstitious one iota but i do have one minor superstition and that is i never ever name the dog the same name twice. I have never done that in 30 years and some odd months of being a musher. I've never had the same dog named the same name twice in all those years. And even if I, I get think a, what you mean is you don't repeat the name. Yeah. Do not repeat the name. So if I had a dog named Max, I would not have Max number two. And I don't think in all those years I've ever gotten a, a dog that has been named the same name either. Have we, Michelle? Um, I don't think so. No, we've been pretty lucky in that aspect. But the the reason why we like to do themes for our dogs, especially when they have been born here, is because it helps me very quickly track who belongs to who, and it takes out the likelihood of inbreeding. Yep. It, is, that... it makes it very easy to be like, okay, this crew is all related. And when that crew, the females go into heat, we immediately move those in heat females away from their brothers. And so that helps us very quickly uh, eliminate any inbreeding that may go on. And then also you have to keep in mind the mom of the rock and roller crew and the reggae crew is the same mom, but she is not in one of our litter themes because we have a litter or a group of dogs that we call the misfit litter that we have obtained from other mushers along the way. And so they don't fit into our naming themes. <laughs> right. So I know that that is really deep guys. And, th and the goal of that is for you guys to think about what would you call your crew or your litter? If you were heading out on Iditarod, you're training up for it right now, what would you call your crew that you had? Whether it be three, four, five, six, maybe even eight dogs, what theme would you go with and why? Would you go something like Duclaw's, Duclaw's Kennel and go with that Asian food theme? Would you go with the Mitch CV? Uh, theme with, uh, it sounded like the, the 1985 Bears with the Fridge and Ditka and that crew, or would you go with something like what we did and go after music icons with uh, Jagger and Jazz and Cobain and Grohl and all those guys? So that is the question. Leave us an answer on social media. Uh, Tony will post it right after the show, and we are excited to talk about them tomorrow. So let's have Tony go first this time. Do you have anything else you want to mention or we missed before we go? 
Uh, the only thing we missed was the little update on Jennifer Labar's finger. She's the only person to still have to have had scratched in this race. Uh, she did update us today that the finger is not just dislocated or just broken. It's dislocated, and she said that she's been told that the bone is actually shattered. So that explains why she was not able to just tape it up and be able to grip the, the handlebar and keep going. Um, so we wish her a speedy recovery. Yep. And Michelle, anything else before we go? No, I think we've gotten it all taken care of. All right, guys. So now is the time to, as they say, pay the bills in podcasting. Make sure you hit that subscribe <laughs> button wherever you're listening. Tell your family and friends how they can listen to. It shares the wealth a little bit and we hope to get new fans Definitely send us over a voicemail or a voice memo. You can do that at 303-578-9881 or the voicemail or voice memo at firstpawmedia at gmail.com. Please let it be only 30 seconds long so we can use it on air and let us know where you're calling in from. So your name and your location. And if you're so inclined... And you want a batch of Tony's world famous Idita cookies, I believe is what you're calling them. Check us out over <laughs> on Patreon. That is patreon.com slash first paw media. And we'll put up a tier is what they're called for those elusive cookies. And if somebody does sign up for that, just be aware that <laughs> we will not get those out to you at least until I did a rod is over for sure. So check us out there. And uh, we thank you guys for your support tomorrow. We're going to be knee deep into the race. We're going to be well over halfway done by, by then I would say most of the teams will have passed the halfway point by that point. And we can talk about uh, the rest of the race because we have, at least another full week to go in our coverage. We always go throughout the banquet. So stay tuned and we'll talk to you guys next time. Goodbye. From Dog Works Radio, this is Mushing Radio. We hope you enjoyed this episode and we invite you to subscribe in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. You'll find a link on the episode notes. You can tap or swipe on the episode cover art and you'll see some offers from our sponsors. You can support our show by supporting them. If you like what you have heard, we would love it if you could give us a five-star rating and tell your friends how to subscribe too. Your host is Robert Forto. Our producers are Michelle Forto, Alex Stein, and Tony Ryder. Our executive producer is Robert Forto. Created for Dogworks Radio and First Paw Media.